Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you may be joining us from today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the Operations Coordinator for CFL York. I would like to officially open the eighth session of the Climate Change Emergencies and Cultural Heritage Speaker Series, which is being presented in partnership with Heritage Ottawa with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tecoronto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, our participants may be joining from various locations, so I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Giuseppe Farino. Dr. Giuseppe Farino is a lecturer in planning at the University of Salford in the United Kingdom. Giuseppe is a human geographer by background. He holds a PhD in economic geography and disaster resilience at Sapienza University of Rome, and a PhD in disaster management at the University of Newcastle in Australia. His research interests covered disaster risk management, risk governance, climate change adaptation, risk governance, disaster project management, and disaster management into higher education. His areas of interest are Italy and Australia and Southeast Asia, including Myanmar, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Thailand. Giuseppe took part in international research projects funded by the European Union, the OLT Australia, and Save the Children. Dr. Frino, thank you very much for moderating today's session, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you for inviting me. Today I will moderate uh, uh, this uh, seminar and of course I'm going to present uh, Moni del Pinto, Dr. Moni del Pinto, who will um, talk today. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Architecture, Building and Civil Engineering at Loughborough University. And she has been recently awarded uh, the Loughborough University Vice Chancellor Independent Research Fellowship. Uh, so she can continue her studies on urban form and disaster risk. Uh, Monia's works, uh, work falls at the intersection of architecture, urban planning, heritage studies and disaster studies. And she aims at innovative methodologies and tools for uh, an effective disaster risk reduction at the urban scale. Um, her research on urban form and disaster risk reconceptualize spatial vulnerability in earthquake uh, prone settlements, uh, as well as she developed a methodology for uh, uh, its assessment, which has uh, been uh, pilot tested in World Heritage Cities exposed to climate induced threats. Uh, Monia has a professional experience in post earthquake reconstruction in L'Aquila, and she's active in communication and training activities for an integrated approach to urban disaster risk management. Uh, since 2014, she has been teaching architecture related disciplines within international and multicultural contexts between Italy, Turkey, and the UK. And she's currently leading the module of disaster uh, management for the built environment at uh, Loughborough University. Uh, she's also my friend and colleague, so I'm very, very happy to welcome her. And uh, I'll leave the word to you. Uh, sorry, a couple of recommendations. If you want to pose, if the audience wants to pose any question at the end of the, at the end of the presentation, they can raise hand. There is a function uh, on the bottom of the screen, or uh, you can use the Q and A function. Uh, uh, you can write question, and then I will read at the end of Monia's presentation. Thank you very much. Monia, over to you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thanks for inviting me here today to Francesco, Kurosh, and Ali. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a second. Hopefully you can see it. So give me a shout if you see, if you can see the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, let's start. Um, as Giuseppe just anticipated, uh, today I'm going to uh, present my current work, um, which is around spatial vulnerability in World Heritage Sites, uh, and introduce my current research project that's being carried out at Loughborough University. Um, but before uh, moving into the core of the current work, 
uh, we need to provide you a bit of a background related to spatial vulnerability and its reconceptualization, which is um, most of uh, the, big, the first part of my work, the, the study that underpins my current research. So today's presentation will focus a bit on that first part, although it's focused on earthquake <laughs> in that bit and not the climate change, then we'll move into climate change and cultural heritage sites uh, in particular. And then I'm going to conclude with a few reflections on the interim work, considering that the work is still ongoing. So I'm expecting this to change, but there are some prompts that I would like to share for discussion with the audience. And yeah, to start, um, to introduce my work, I have to start uh, with an introduction to um, the idea of uh, public cases and special practices uh, and the observations that preceded my research. So uh, everyday special practices, so the way we use space in the everyday, it's what shapes our behavior in the same space during the emergency and sometimes can endanger us. This assumption, this departure point, uh, underpins my first research. The images that you see here are kind of self-explanatory. Uh, they refer to the same square, which is Piazza San Benedetto in Norcia, central Italy, in three different moments before uh, the earthquakes in 2016, when the square was used by citizens and tourists, um, and um, let's say as the, the core space of the city. Uh, in the first of a long series of uh, shocks, so during the first earthquake in 2016, the one that hit Amatrice first in the 24, on the 24th of August, but was felt in North and then people crowded the open spaces uh, and the, the square, Piazza San Benedetto, was actually one of the first informal somehow uh, open shelters for people. And the last image shows the same square on the 26th of October when the main shock hit uh, Norcia. So Norcia was very close to the, the epicenter for the shock. And the city was evacuated, so no one was at risk in that specific moment. But it's easy to understand and to imagine how things would evolve if instead of being a for, an aftershock, that would have been the main shock. So everyone flocking into that would have been somehow affected by the damage and the disruption in the spatial network. All this to say, very quickly, that that was the idea uh, behind spatial vulnerability, trying to understand the role of the urban spatial network in the variations of urban disaster risk. The initial focus, as I mentioned, was on earthquakes. And I'm going to quickly touch upon that type of work, um, starting from the assumption that um, the key consideration for me around space was that uh, space is the underlying element of both the physical and the social city, but uh, tends to be um, not... Um, at the forefront when we design our cities, we plan them, and also when we think about disaster risk management. And in particular, the network of urban public open spaces, which is the uninterrupted network of uh, publicly accessible open spaces, which we would summarize in Italy at least as streets and squares, um, is the first for informal infrastructure activated in the earthquake response, which is activated globally, so in every point and simultaneously at the same time. It is, however, also a very much overlooked functional element in urban planning and emergency planning, in the sense that the network effect is not really uh, investigated because space tend, tends to be partitioned and um, approached with a very static, prescriptive um, approach to land use, basically. And the last and not, and probably the most important point that the network effect is absent from the spatial vulnerability discourse. Um, because when we look at vulnerability of cities, we look at how buildings are affected, so the physical vulnerability, how people, so the social component, but we don't really know, uh, we haven't focused so far on how spaces are affected by or somehow sometimes even catalysts of vulnerability. So far, in fact, spatial vulnerability in disaster studies has a very strong geocentric connotation and it's intended as a map of vulnerability and accordingly uh, adopted when we look at spaces. My study tried to kind of unpack the role of space, as I said, and uh, the focus uh, was on the four case studies hit by the 2016-17 earthquake um, through a mixed method analysis in, um, using qualitative and quantitative methods to look into configuration, practices of use, and management of space uh, in the two different scenarios, every day in the emergency. And the methodological steps that are let's say were key for my investigation, were centered around the recontextualizing disaster risk knowledge through the lens of space. 
trying to isolate vulnerability associated to the spatial network as vulnerability of space and from space. So by specializing disaster is variables um, by the configuration measures and uh, the role of land use and attractor distribution, um, it was possible for me to develop a workflow and assess um, spatial and safe conditions and then uh, assess how they manifest, um, how spatial vulnerability manifests. And that knowledge was then interpreted um, through the pressure and release model that enabled me kind of sorting and distinguish root causes, dynamic pressures and unsafe conditions. This is a very quick um, overview of how the spatial analysis workflow worked, but you can scan the QR code for publication or you can access my um, at the very end, I'm going to give you the link to my Google Scholar page with all the list of publications. So there is no need for you to kind of screenshot this image right now. Uh, the key point that I would like to highlight and that would be important for us to understand the next step is understanding how what features within the configuration of the network were relevant for me to model spatial vulnerability. And I focus in particular on visibility or movement information. So I measured, assessed and visualized key variables that enable me understanding what was the role that the network played. So on one side, when I was assessing the capacity of site protection, um, it was important for me to understand how moving it within the layout enabled um, acquiring very specific visual information. So the quality and the stability of visual field was uh, for me a proxy to assess the capacity of site protection of users in space. So what are the longest and interrupted visual fields, where decision points are, what how stable the visual fields are as uh, pedestrians move along space and so on. Whereas uh, to assess exposure, that for me was the second um, and most important um, variables that uh, combined with capacity suggest and inter um, informs about vulnerability, I focused instead on the segments, on the street segments through the angular segment analysis. So. Um, based on the type of movement suggesting whether a segment is used or a strict segment is used as a path or a destination, I was able to, again, quantify, visualize and map uh, the exposure of specific evacuation routes. All that led to reconceptualizing spatial vulnerability at the urban scale as the condition linked to reduce performances of space in the emergency, potentially making the whole city, the whole urban system more sensitive to the impact of an earthquake in particular and manifesting as reduced capacities and increased exposure of portions of the network of its occupants. The work was, of course, relevant both in theory and practice, and in particular, now we are going to focus on how the practical information become relevant for the next stage of my research. Uh, because the special vulnerability expose some of the disasters dynamic at the urban scale that tend to be undetected, for example, the absence of the network and its user from the planning and disaster risk scores, but also the fact that production of spaces then tends to be driven by profit and interest, and so real estate values, but also sometimes identical reconstruction and touristifications. The role of the users that tend to be seen as consumers uh, in the everyday and aided in the emergency, and that, that justifies how they are somehow marginal into the planning and the RRP scores. And the last but not least important is that especially unsafe conditions exist but stay undetected because of our uh, kind of blind spot in this case. And for that reason, also tend to stay untreated and cyclically restored with urban form. Now, I put here just an overview of the city of Amatrice just to show how historic has been somehow consistently restored. And it tends to be <laughs> restored also uh, in the post-disaster reconstruction, although everything has to be rebuilt uh, from scratch. The incidental finding of that work enabled me moving on to the next stage. So if heritage, I work with historical urban area, not codified, uh, not listed heritage places, but uh, it somehow uh, emerged that heritage conservation measures tend to, um, especially the conservative ones, tend to restore both the urban features and the associated disaster risk from the respective space that was a kind of a very uh, interesting finding and this opens a series of further research questions because if the fingerprint of the city through space that carries values and meaning for uh, the local community um, but also it's also important for the local economy and at the same time carries um, potential for disaster risk so tends to endanger the visitor uh, 
what is the impact that uh, the heritage management policies and conservation policies can have on an effective disaster risk reduction in historical urban areas? And in particular, what does this imply in world heritage cities that face emerging climate related threats? So this move enabled me moving on to the next step of my research where I broadened the scope of the initial work and the scale, focusing on different hazards and different layout features and trying to bring the users into the picture. And here is the, uh, the current work that I'm um, carrying out right now within my um, doctoral prize fellowship. Uh, so the current work is, is named Daedalus and it aims at assessing um, spatial vulnerability for different threats, in particular climate related threats and um, try and assess how the historical spatial layouts in world heritage cities um, influence the user safety in the face of these threats. Uh, the work is part of it, as we mentioned initially, of the Doctoral Prize Fellowship, but then it will can be framed within a bigger and a bit more of an ambitious work towards um, review of policies uh, to, that regard our heritage, and we will see in a minute, minute what I mean by then. The work is split into two big macro objectives. One is called danger roots, uh, and one is exodus. The danger roots objective aims at assessing um, and mapping the disaster results of streets and squares, but in this case, it referring to climate threats. And the exodus focuses on the exposure of users, trying to mapping user-specific disaster risk variations. The outputs expected from this work are not just an extended and consolidated methodology and parameters for spatial vulnerability that includes an additional hazard, but also visualization of user-specific, context-specific, and open source risk information that can be then implemented uh, in a series of areas from urban planning and spatial planning, heritage management, up to the very uh, in, kind of relevant aspect of tourist management in uh, urban heritage um, and city heritage cities. The case studies I'm working with are um, now also spread elsewhere. Do we lost Monia? Monia, can you hear us? Let's see what happens. Um, I'm trying to contact her on WhatsApp. Great, thank you. Seems like she's still connected. Yeah, but well, she's stuck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The screen stopped sharing. Yeah, we'll Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I think she will not respond. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. We can give her a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Yes, yes. I know. <clears throat> Let me. Monia, are you back? Uh, yes, I don't know where, what was the last thing you could hear from me. I realized that something went wrong with the connection. <laughs> yeah, the, well, if you if you share your screen, we can see where you were again. Okay, I'm sharing my window again. Could you see the slide? Just a second. I think you, you were probably the slide before. Let me see. Before, before as well. No, even before. Wow. Okay. Yeah, You've lost this, the this was no, no. This was this. This was the slide. Yeah. This was. Yeah. This was it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's restart from here. 
So I have five extra minutes, right? Yes, no worries. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I, um, is everything ready? Are you recording so I can proceed? Yeah, you yeah. can go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. So I was introducing the Daedalus study. Um, so the idea was to broaden the scope of the spatial vulnerability research um, to historical, um, so to world heritage cities exposed to climate induced threats. And this, the, um, the study is part of the um, of my current fellowship, but it frame it's kind of framed within the broader uh, a broader perspective, kind of an ambitious goal, which is trying and uh, gathering evidence toward um, a review of policies of policies on on heritage conservation. That's kind of quite an advanced uh, that will happen hopefully at quite an advanced stage, but it's becoming it's been so far a great platform to gather this a lot of information. On the subject, um, the project consists of two macro objectives. Uh, they are consecutive. One is dangerous, and one is exodus. Dangerous uh, consists of assessing and mapping the disasters potential of the historical roads um, exposed to climate threats, and we'll see in a minute how it uh, unfolds. And the exodus instead brings the users into the picture by assessing and mapping uh, user-specific disaster risk variations. The idea is to obtain, um, in terms of outputs, not just a solid methodology that um, enables modeling spatial vulnerability, at least for two hazards and the corresponding parameters, but also uh, visualization of user-specific, context-specific, and uh, risk information that are I, meant to be open source, uh, which means that they will be able to then inform urban planning and spatial planning, heritage management, and disasters management, but also most importantly for heritage destination, uh, tourist management. The case studies I'm working with for this pilot uh, work are the city of Bath in the UK and the city of Georgetown in Malaysia. They were both chosen not just because I, I wanted to explore special layouts that were in different regions of the world, So they kind of carrying different different cultures, and those features are kind of in our um, two contexts where it would be possible to implement part of the findings. So it would be possible an effective data exchange and an impact uh, via specific activities that are carried out. For example, in Georgetown, there is a very strong community-based disaster risk management uh, work, um, which by having an additional layer would for sure uh, be a great floor to test uh, the spatial vulnerability findings. And the same for Bath. Uh, with the World Heritage app that tourists can use to navigate the heritage. And ideally, my great hope is to kind of create an additional layer for that and providing a safe uh, spatial navigation in the city. So I'm now moving on to the specifics of the project, looking at how um, spatial vulnerability, the first objective that I, that I mentioned, so the danger root objective is being modeled on the city of Bath. And so just to provide you a bit of background on Bath World Heritage City, uh, the city was inscribed in the World Heritage List in 1987, and he, the, the city itself has um, a deep and long story. Like we have the Roman Bath, the Georgian Bath, the Industrial Bath that contribute to creating the historical core, the historical heart of the city. But the site itself, the heritage site, goes beyond the urban area and encloses also a lot of, um, let's say, a buffer in a natural um, area outside. So for a total of 29 square kilometers. And it's also one of the sites that also re um, can record the very high uh, visitors number per year. But there's also a very um, relevant flood history. Um, but from the 1970s, the recurring floods that have been uh, affecting the city were somehow managed thanks to the implementation of flood mitigation measures that we will see in a few slides. And most recently, the city has been um, kind of developing its own um, regeneration program centered around um, the public realm and in particular the public spaces. So there is a lot of information on how spaces are used, resignified, uh, restored, and there is a lot to think about in how that intersect with heritage, but also can intersect with disaster risk management. And um, speaking of climate instead, um, the climate emergency strategy 
for bus, but in general uh, at the moment, tends to be very centered around building. Uh, so we focus on the emissions, we focus on decarbonization. Very little is yet to be done around space. Uh, regardless, in spite of the emergence of some very specific, atypical climate-related threats that look like bring space into the forefront, like heat waves that can affect uh, also the outdoor spaces, but also extreme weather events like flash floods. So within Bath, how do we model, how, what's my approach to model the spatial vulnerability to climate change? Um, within the dangerous objective, here you can see the bigger um, boundaries of the city. Of course, it would be impossible for me to, to model everything. So the many, the first and most important decision was to decide within which boundaries to operate and what what features of the urban spatial network were relevant and how they intersected with the um, OUVs, the Ostend Universal Values of the city. At the same time, I had to consider the spatial layout and not just the primary hazard, but most importantly, the climate-induced hazard. Uh, defining the hazard and the spatial variables together would enable defining the spatial hazard, spatial exposure, and spatial capacity of cell protection. And all this information, once this stage of the study is completed, will be validated by the workshop with um, the local community and local stakeholders and the results of the to the survey. Modeling the um, Urban form meant, as I mentioned, defining boundaries, defining what spatial features were relevant. So I focus on the historical core of the city and um, where the medieval, the Georgian, and the industrial city were somehow uh, the remnants of those were uh, are still visible and influencing the um, urban form. And say urban form. So the street network is a key element, but also understanding the contemporary uses of space was a key uh, information. Moving on to the hazard, besides the historical floods mentioned earlier that have been, as we can see from evidence, very uh, kind of massively impacting the city in the past, as it's been recorded also in many of the uh, of the bridges along the, the River Avon, this is what happened in the past. Now we don't have, or at least there isn't that sort of uh, perception of urgency towards addressing that type of flood risk. But if we look into the climate projection, um, there is an expected temperature rise and expected expected uh, increase of extreme weather events uh, that would lead to very specific manifestation, not just in terms of heat waves, but also in particular in refer to uh, events like flash floods. And this, like the first or probably the, the last of the events has happened just a couple of weeks ago on the 6th of January, where uh, the River Avon was uh, recorded the highest uh, levels, like 3.8 meters above the normal range. So for at least for 2024, that was the highest <laughs> on the 6th of January. We will see what happens uh, in the next 12 months. Uh, and besides having an impact on the river, there was an impact on the cultural heritage site uh, that um, in particular, we have the Roman baths, which um, where the thermal waters tend to be somehow had to reach the river. It wasn't possible for the water to flow back into the river. So there were some areas that tend to be dry that were kind of flooded by the thermal water. Uh, uh, within this specific event. The specific model of spatial vulnerability for climate um, requires scenario. My focus was not to look into the worst case scenario of four degrees um, above the industrial level, but I focus on the, an increase based on the Met Office climate projection on only two degrees above the pre-industrial levels. This, however, still suggests that it's going to be an increase in maximum temperatures in the summer, decreased wind speed, and the reduced effective, for example, of corridor of ventilation corridors outdoor. And at the same time, an increase, um, although we have reduced expectation of rainy days, the weather events tend to be uh, more intense uh, and more frequent. The hazardous consequences relevant for these studies were identified as the urban heat island effect and flash floods that intersect with very specific spatial features like the historic streetscape, so the street width and the heights of buildings, materials that are somehow very specific uh, for the character of the place, the underground vaults, because in Bath we don't just have what's above the ground, but also what's below the ground that influences the distribution of trees, but also the drainage system structure. And um, all these features are part of the heritage attributes that we have to consider when working with a heritage site. So the Georgian architecture and Georgian tomb planning and Roman archaeology. With this picture, we have a first understanding of how these three elements interplay. 
Um, now, to specialize the disaster is variables, it is important to connect the configurational properties of the historical layout and the safety of the contemporary spatial experience. Um, so for, to do so, it is important, again, to mobilize space syntax. Here you see in this picture a very high level uh, map produced by the um, space syntax limit, limited uh, labs that covers the whole UK, and this is what is covered through BAP. But to me, that was, um, again, too high level. I need the more granular approach. So I refined the analysis, um, focusing, first of all, on the features of the medieval and Georgian city that are still present in the, every, in, in the current path. So the street layout that were meant for transactions so commerce and procession, and the Georgian layout that was meant for social interaction, pleasure, and um, enjoyment. So we have the areas for parades or the areas for uh, processions. And the second step was try and refine the initial map that I showed you by uh, modeling the space syntax, uh, angular space. In, in this case, you're visualizing the angular segment analysis of the core of Bath, where I would be able to, from which I would be able to extract context specific information on movement uh, to be then connected and then accessibility and um, how specific rules play a role within the bigger picture, so what the destinations are versus what the paths are, to just in a nutshell so express what I'm doing, and connect this uh, information to hazard and exposure. How does it work? It works that, for example, when we look at the urban heat island in relation to urban form, we know that the outdoor perception of uh, comfort or discomfort for special users is very often associated to the variety and the autonomy of path choice. So information on how we move in space, on how space su supports that type of movement can tell us how uh, and if uh, that layout uh, responds well um, to, a specific, to a specific temperature increase. In relation to flash flood on a similar scale but um, kind of broadening a bit, uh, the reflection, knowing where the highest movement potential lays, we also know where the highest footfall um, happens. So where is the higher exposure, which areas of the city expose the highest number of people. And so expecting the magnitude of disruption, which also reflects on local business. This is where I am now, and I'm not releasing a lot of uh, specific data because it's very early at this stage, but it's possible for me to just see that um, this work on spatial vulnerability um, doesn't replicate, doesn't replace existing uh, vulnerability assessment methodology. Uh, work vulnerability to climate change and um, we have on the top the one developed by James Cook University uh, on the left side we have the climate vulnerability proposed by Park Canada which was I think presented also here before Christmas both of them provide a very um a, a very high level assessment, which enables also understanding how climate change can impact a place, its community, and um, the activities, not the economy that takes place in the, in the specific heritage site. But what the spatial vulnerability does um, on top of that is modeling around the specific selected climate stressor, how they interact and influence, uh, interact with space and influence um, and are influenced by the spatial network. Um, of course, this means that when we work with heritage attributes, we may not focus on every single attribute, but only with those who are, that are associated to urban form, and then consequently how the interplay within, between this information and the OUVs can be used. And finally, the relationship with people. So whereas uh, spatial vulnerability look at all the users of space, which means not just the permanent users, the residents, the community, but also uh, the transitory users. That could be tourists, like in the, I mentioned in Bath, but could be anyone who's a reduced spatial knowledge and is consequently potentially more exposed because simply navigating a space that you don't know makes, um, creates a specific pattern of specific behavior that differs a lot from the behavior and the knowledge of the people who use that space in their everyday.
Just to conclude now, um, a couple of reflections. And the first uh, slide is connected to the limitations of the studies of R and the challenges experienced, because uh, I mentioned before, this is a pilot study carried out within a two years research time. Uh, so it has to be really squeezed into a very short uh, time scale. So for results to be um, effective and tested, we may need longer than that, but at least uh, it is possible to at least outline connections and then uh, see where uh, they will develop in the next stage of research. Um, one of the challenges was the difference in modeling spatial vulnerability to earthquakes versus spatial vulnerability to climate. Although the methodological steps are the same, there are some variables that you have summarized here in the table that are deeply different, uh, starting from the type of hazard, because in the case of earthquake, we have one specific hazard that we know and we can model things around. But in relation to climate change, the variability of hazards, so the range of primary hazards that can manifest can also generate so many multiple cascading um, hazard manifesting in space that it really requires making choices and not really knowing what happens or which of them can, is kind of more likely to happen. And also in terms of boundaries and extension and scale, there are relatively, um, th there are some differences that were relatively uh, important, whereas because, for example, in relation to climate change, um, the scale can be territorial, but then uh, at the urban scale, we can have very localized manifestation, whereas for earthquake, it's much easier to see uh, at the urban scale, the whole area could be affected with, of course, variations based on geological profiles. And finally, with the climate change, we have not just the rapid onset event, but also slow onset events uh, that we tend to underestimate. And the, so the impact to be traced is a different type of impact, not just physical, but also sometimes social and on the health of the occupants. And the last point is about data availability and access, because um, the climate data available per region tend to be very different. So there, is, there might be not a unified data set so results can be somehow skewed because of that. Um, climate risk assessment methodology, you may know now after the end of this work, uh, in the middle of this speaker series that there are so many methodologies out there, all of them valid, uh, but still providing a very um, heterogeneous uh, set of methods to choose. And then for, for the specific study, the access to user experience information can be challenging because not being in touch with both the sides, not being physically present, for example, in Georgetown could kind of make challenging that specific aspect. Conclude uh, with a clinical perspective and an open question. Um, and I'd like to be critical, I'd like to open this provocation and I hope people from the audience will kind of uh, uh, and kind of take the chance to, to share their opinion on this, to share their ideas and start a discussion. Because so far, it's clear that the perception of cultural heritage for us is still very uh, much influenced by specific principle. Heritage is the object of preservation, the object of visitation, is known in disaster risk as a catalyst for resilience. So we only look at that from a specific perspective. Either we protect it or we use it to channel resilience. It's very hard to look at it as disaster risk agent because this questions our approach to heritage. It questions the very essence uh, of heritage as something to preserve. And this, um, this attitude generates or has generated shortcomings in disaster risk reduction at the urban scale we've seen. We've seen that uh, what we conserve is what sometimes, as we restore features, we restore the associated disaster risk. And this is what I define the heritage conservation paradox. So I'd like to open a question um, that is a bit, again, a provocation. Is climate change, climate emergency. Can we look at that also as an opportunity? Because to me, um, that could be a really strong opportunity to unlock a critical approach to heritage for re, re negotiate the values associated to it, try and deconstruct meanings, resignify them in light of challenges that exist for the contemporary society, enable action on heritage when possible in the area that somehow are um, relevant for what the heritage of the future would be, and co-creating that with the communities that are um, living in those places. So again, this may sound uh, probably too extreme, uh, for, especially for 
those who have a very conservative approach. But I believe if we want to, it's a challenge that we have to embrace and I'm really interested in listening from the audience. And so I leave you with the open question right now, but I'm happy to answer questions about uh, what I've just presented. And if you want to get in touch, these are all my contacts and the QR code is for the Google Scholar page. I hope and run over time. You I are think perfect, I'm okay. perfectly on time, Monia, perfectly on time. Great, so I'm gonna stop sharing or I can go back to the slides depending on what works best. Um, I don't know. First of all, I would like to know <clears throat> if there are any questions from the audience. So you can raise your hand or you can uh, um, write your question in the Q&A uh, window. So there are a few people in the audience, a few people in the audience <clears throat> who might have a question. So I have a couple of questions, but I want to wait for, for them first. Thank you. Okay, so... Okay, so I see there are two questions. So the, the first question is from Susan Moradi, and they say, according to your research and in your opinion, what can be the most uh, effective behavior for protections for protection inside at risk of floods and cold? Uh, what would be the best effective behavior for protection? Most effective behavior for protections of sites at risk of floods and cold. Uh, okay, I only got flood, but okay, I will start with that. So there are a lot of. Um, I think yeah, it's cold, so to... probably freezing or something like this. So. Okay, okay, thank you. I didn't get the last one. Yeah. Um, according to my research, or oh, well, this my work into the flood specific modeling is very limited yet at, the, at this stage because I've just approached the climate related aspect. Um, and then I think depending on it, it, the very clear aspect to me so far, being exposed to different locations and seeing how all of them respond to very spe context specific hazards, I think the, hazard, the flood response measures tend to be um, strong in places where unfortunately floods are, um, let's say, the, the local hazard. Because if I have to look back, for example, in my experience in modeling in multi-hazard context, even in Italy, we know, for example, that when flood, I've studied, I've been working with uh, places like Bisso, where the most important hazard was earthquake, but we had, there was a river uh, crossing the, there is a river crossing the, the segment, yet the, the flood mitigation measures became secondary when the main hazard was so predominant. Um, going back to the question specifically, in relation to space, if I get the, if I got it right, um, I, I don't think I have an answer yet to that in the sense that spatial modeling, I'm trying to go back to the slides to look for um, the slides in Bath, for example, the flood mitigation measures in Bath. These are, this is the flood protection scheme that was implemented in the city in the, 1970, in the 1970s, after the big flood that was recorded in the 1960s. And well, consolidation of uh, the area where prone to the um, to the river flood and the creation of barriers was basically the, the approach and is what has protected the city so far. So to the point that the reasons, not even the perception of flood as a, as a hazard right now. Uh, whereas if I have to look at flash floods that come from precipitation, knowing that that's a potential hazard, it's already something that we have to bear in mind. Because if we look at the flash floods that are a very, uh, very recent phenomenon, uh, if compared to the hist historical flood in Bath right now, as I mentioned earlier, the, the urban drainage system in Bath specifically, may be not prepared for that and may be unable to be uh, retrofitted for that because of the interplay of that very specific hazard with uh, the underground vault system that's part of the archeological uh, heritage values, uh, heritage attributes. So it's carrying a specific outstanding universal value and it cannot be altered. So it, is, it would be the case at some point to envisage different measures to either work on uh, increasing the number of drains rather than the depth, for example, or reconsider how 
and this is where I try to think of activating heritage, we consider what priorities we have in relation to the expected impact of specific flash floods. I don't know if the answer is what was expected, but I'm actually still looking for that type of myself in the sense that there are scenarios that are can be modeled, but there are then uh, very context specific manifestations of the same phenomenon that pose questions that are still, again, very context specific. Whereas the cold, um, I don't, if it's about cold in the sense of the fr freeze and thaw cycles, uh, so we have to, and here I kind of I wear my architecture and engineering hat, I would say, I would think about considering type of materials that we have to take care of. And in heritage sites, I'm pretty sure there are already measures in place to uh, make sure that the temperature swings, especially the very low temperature, um, are to be controlled because that's a problem that pre-existed the disaster risk assessment in, relate, in relation to architectural heritage, for example. We know that uh, historical buildings are very much, very fragile in the face of um, cold or an ice because the porosity of materials is what determines the damage. So again, it, it's very specific, very context specific, and I haven't treated that yet. So I'm really sorry that my answer is kind of partial. I haven't treated that yet in relation to spatial vulnerability. I will be happy to, uh, if I'm able to, to develop my research. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Monia. Further. Um, yeah, thank you. There is another question by Ali Kamis, um, which uh, uh, actually uh, is asking, uh, what is essential in uh, applying urban planning practices for reversing the impacts of, of climate change or the impacts on cultural heritage sites? So how urban planning practices can help mitigating or responding to the impacts on, on cultural heritage sites? That's a nice question, <laughs> because there is where um, all the tensions um, seem to be. Because there are, even in, again, I go back to Bath because it's the most closest example that I made. Um, the urban regeneration program is Bath, but is many other heritage cities. It some, tends to uh, address some of the key sustainability and climate change related um, matters. No? So there is an attempt at um, improving for what we can improve. But the limitation lies in where in, in the areas where conservation measures insist. And when heritage is present, we know that conserv heritage conservation, heritage preservation wins over uh, urban renewal and urban regeneration projects. So there are always tensions at the interface of the projects of urban renewal and urban um, adaptation, urban, like urban measures for climate change adaptation or mitigation. Whenever they uh, challenge, whenever they threaten the integrity, uh, the authenticity, uh, and the presence of, of attributes themselves. Again, making an, uh, an example connected to Bath, and I'm going to build upon the same point that I made uh, about the underground vaulting system. We wouldn't think about that, but with the underground vault system within an urban area, it means that there is a very specific depth underneath which you can, for example, dig. So you cannot plant trees. So the first thing that was shared with me by uh, the local planning planners uh, when we first had the conversation was exactly this. There are some limitations that are, and some constraints that are connected strictly to the, pre the strong presence of heritage. And here is where we negotiate, here is where Tensions happen and we a solution that can be achieved by planning may not always be ideally uh, ideal as it is initially conceived. And there is where the trade-offs start. Um, so yeah, it's always a matter of very context-specific challenges. Sometimes it is possible to work on the um, buffer area or it is possible to work in an area where you are not directly touching heritage, but you can still operate in a way to protect that. Other times, this is simply not possible, and then it's a matter of deciding and prioritizing, depending on policies and management uh, regulation, basically. Yeah. Thank you, Monia. Um, there is uh, there are any other questions from the audience? I have a couple of questions, but let's see again if there are. Uh, okay, I don't see any. Um, well, if I may, I, I would like to to pose a couple of questions. Or we still have a few minutes, so. <clears throat> The first question is, uh, 
um, you, I think you showed towards the yeah, towards one of the last slides. So, but if you can el elaborate a bit more, so what are the what is the relationship of spatial vulnerability with, uh, let's say, social and physical vulnerability? This is the first. Uh, this is the first question. The second question is uh, okay. You didn't you didn't show um, too much details about, for example, the indicators uh, of for your assessment, but whether and how is it possible to make an assessment also beyond indicators? Uh, okay. I'll, um, can you elaborate on the last point? Uh, do you mean like a fast assessment or that we don't need a specific quantitative approach? No, no, I'm just, no, I'm just asking. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying we don't need, we don't need indicators. I'm saying if, if it is also possible to make an assessment beyond indicators this is what okay. i'm saying yes so okay i'm just writing down because i forget yeah uh, so yes the first uh, question was about how does it relate to physical and the social the interaction between spatial the interaction of spatial vulnerability with social and physical vulnerability uh it is very this answer is uh, somehow partially linked to the very first slide that i presented when i introduced the space as a as a and the spatial network as a sort of the the backbone the shared underpinning element of uh a bit of the physical and the social city because it's probably the, the example that I can make, and it's a bit easier to get uh, to grasp at this stage because I have a bit more information on that is on the, when I model spatial vulnerability for earthquakes, for example, it is inevitably connect the vulnerability of space. It is inevitably connected to the vulnerability of buildings, at least for part of um, for the buildings that are aligned along, along the space. I'm going back to the slide where I'm, that I'm going to use to answer this question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Here. So we are in the spatial exposure. So it's on the right side of the picture on the slides. And buildings along space, I mean, the interplay of building and space is what generates urban form. So the building patterns, the physical, uh, this, uh, the arrangement of buildings somehow, and the configuration of space cannot be completely separated. The point is that there is a moment where the physical building that insists on a specific route may or may not threaten it depending on their physical integrity. So the physical vulnerability becomes a proxy for the vulnerability of the route. So the exposure of that route or that square of that specific space and its occupants. Um, but at the same time, the configuration itself and the potential for that space to be uh, more or less uh, crowded because by configuration it attracts movement, so it has a higher chance to be used as a pathway. It's something that is just inherent to space. So these two aspects are kind of connected, and in the case of, of spatial vulnerability, buildings cannot be removed from the picture, but cannot be the only element of the picture. That's the, the important kind of statement that I would like to um, the important mm -hmm. information that I like to pass through. And then the social vulnerability, so the, the social component, and here we could actually break it down into um, a series of kind of subfolder other layers because um, access to space, accessibility to space, uh, the capacity and the, um, from, from spatial knowledge to um, the policies of space that we make somehow influence and affect its user, right? So specific policies prevent or specific areas, you have um, certain types of users versus other types of users. I think she got stuck again. So, Monia, you got you, yeah, you, you got yeah, you you got stuck. So, yeah, I, I think I, I don't know you, what you what well, you missed. Just, but... just, yeah, just just try to finish this question because I don't think we have time for the other question on 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 uh, indicators. So. Thing is that by creating 
the physical integration of segregation of specific areas as a direct impact on the segregation and or integration of specific groups that live there. So as a con mm -hmm. consequence, in a nutshell, this yeah. cannot be, aspect cannot be disconnected. So the moment this aspect is clear, it is easy to. And quickly on the indicators, indicators are an, an element that is like a, a tool, but Again, we don't need necessarily to get to the indicators to uh, ask to to understand how space is used. So, those are a way to measure and to quantify and to kind of compare information, especially from different cases. But um, there is a lot of there is a big quantitative aspect in this work that has to do with understanding practices of use, special practices in the past, before how they've been rebuilt during the uh, after the emergency. So, a lot of that passes through understanding what happens in space beyond measuring that. So yeah, yeah. they exist, they're both valid. Uh, and again, they cannot be disconnected. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of um, information to unpack. Yeah, um, okay. That is thank it. You. Thank you very much, Monia. Uh, thank you to all the participants. I leave the word to Corosh or Fran Francesco. Or... And thanks a lot. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Monia. Thank you very much, Giuseppe, for both of you for being here. Thank you, Monia, for the great presentation. Just happy for moderating the session. Um, thank you as well to everyone who attended um, in the audience. Thank you for asking the questions, for participating, and for being here um, and for supporting the series. Um, I would just very quickly like to share my screen just to show um, the next session that we have coming up um, in February 5th with Dr. Henrik Schoenenfeldt, um, who will be presenting on Architectural Biographies of Resilience, an inquiry into the significance of historic adaptations for sustainable conservation. Um, so as always, a registration is still open um, and will remain open until the end of the series. So please feel free to continue sharing this um, series and the registration link with your networks and to anyone who might find this interesting. Um, and as always, this session is being recorded and can be found both on our event page for this series and on our YouTube channel, which I have shared in the chat. Um, so just uh, one last big thank you to everybody for being here. Um, it was a great presentation. It was a great session. Um, so thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.